conceptual perspective. Talk about Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick. Um, Saturday morning on the way to the gym. Uh, hope everybody is having a great start to your week, weekend, excuse me, and that you are doing the things in life that fulfill you. As for me, I'm definitely doing the things in life that fulfill me. Uh, it doesn't come without challenges. It doesn't come without difficulty. It doesn't come without frustration. Life in its highest state is filled with challenges. Anything that you want in life is going to require you to move through some difficult obstacles, restraints, delays, frustrations. It's simply what it is. So when I talk about it, I'm just at a point where I'm really mulling it over in my mind and looking at what I went through this year. And it, it, it was it's nothing short of amazing that I'm still standing. But I expect to win. Even when I'm taking blows, I expect to win. That's how I'm built. That's what I do. Uh, so for the love everybody's shown me in this in this year, know that your love is appreciated. Your support is appreciated. And I will continue to do everything I can to be a force in our community, a force in the world. Um, a resource to people looking to change their lives and a source of information for those who want to be a part of changing the outlook for the black race. Now, let's move into why I'm here this morning. Every weekend, we try to do what we call the fundraising boost. Um, I'll be honest with you, it, this hasn't been successful. Fundraising hasn't been successful um, overall. Uh, I do the vast majority of the funding of the program. When I say vast majority, I mean pretty much all of it. Uh, Dr. Michael Blanchard has been a supporter over the years. Uh, there have been some of you guys who have given over the course of this year and previous years. But when you look at what it costs to be a resource in the community with the things that I'm about to share with you, you can understand that $100 here, $10 there, $50 there is so appreciated by me because to me, I'm not looking at the amount. I'm looking at the vote of confidence. So there's no amount too small for me to have appreciation for. But when it comes to operational functionality, what it can do, then we're looking at, okay, there's a deficit. And so that deficit has to be covered. Um, the most talked about program, obviously, is Black Men Lead. And what's crazy is I'll be on and I'll be talking about like this week. The that was a focus, a couple of videos that were focused on uh, black femicide, the killing of black women and the need for black women to feel safe and protected. And 
it, it never fails and it, it blows my mind but it never fails that there were some people that showed up um, you know black, black males that showed up and felt like black men were being slighted despite the fact that the number one program pushed and, and focused on in this is aimed at helping black males not only get through childhood through rite of passage, but we have mental health programs, we have skills training programs, we have uh, <clears throat> mentorship programs. So we focus heavily on that because we understand the need and the role that the black man plays in the rise of the black race. We understand what how important the black women are to the rise of the black race. That's why we're consistently talking about the need to have them protected. And so my thing is I am balanced in my approach. Now, I'm, I, I think I may be harder on the men because I'm a man. And I, a, as a man, I was reared by my great grandfather. So I'm reared by a man that was born in 1909, the son of a sharecropper. And excuses were never allowed in our house. You either did it or you didn't. Somebody won't let me is not an excuse. This happened. You won't. I mean, I was told early on, you think, again, I'm talking to the son of a sharecropper, somebody who had to drop out of school in the second grade in order to go out in the fields and help his dad so that they can make ends meet. That's the kind of man that reared me, but he ended up a retired master welder, a business owner. And so, obviously, that was no excuse in the house. If he did it coming up doing some of the most, we're talking Jim Crow in Louisiana. So, it was no excuses. So, when I am hard on the men, it's because I have a standard that I'm living by, and it's the C.D. Wallace standard. It's what I look at. It's how he handled my grandmother. It's how he, he, he was the average kid. He wasn't the most softest person. He wasn't, a, a, you know... I heard a, I love you a lot more as I grew older than I did as a little kid, uh, you know, but I saw it in the amount of attention and time he gave me in schooling me and bringing me out when he was working on the car and bringing me out when he was doing some drywalling in the house, bringing me out. And then the, the, the moment, the moments that we had every day I came home from schooling, he was sitting on the front porch. And he say, sit down. I knew we were about to have a talk. And I can't tell you to the day why, as a young kid from about, this started when I was 10. And it went all the way up until I left the house. I can't tell you why, as a kid, I, that, I was cool with that. It was I was looking forward to that. That dude could talk to you and tell you about his history, about life. I learned so much about Jim Crow. And, what, and, and I learned so much about business. I learned so much from sitting down and listening to him so yes i'm harder on the men but hey it's because i want so much for us and i am i have said this countless times and i'm sure i'll say it plenty more we will only get as high as our women can spiritually lift us and as far as our men can physically lead us we need each other. We can sit up and we can spend all of our time complaining about what each other did and who's at fault and why everything is wrong and, and all of that. And all we'll do is do what they designed the things that are in our way to do. And that's disrupt us, uh, disband us and destroy us. That's what we're headed for. We have our children our children's children won't have a future. I'm looking at my oldest granddaughter, she'll be 15, and I'm going, she's not gonna have a future if I don't do something. She's not gonna have a young man we can trust even come into her life and be a husband. Hell, they might not even want to have husbands and wives the way things are going. They're gonna buy into this idea you can just procreate and go on, we're gonna co-parent. And when you have to co-parent because stuff with just was that awful, you got to know how to do that and you got to be able to do it responsibly and, and, and from a place of maturity. But that's not optimal parenting. It ain't even close. There's such a role 
that is missing because the masculinity and presence of the man is absent. Just the presence of a person who's operating in the fullness of their manhood is so powerful and we're not doing it. But the, we have other programs. We have the Music music is Life program. That's where we are determined to teach every black child how to play at least one instrument and how to read music. The ability to create music, the ability to play music is so powerful. It's, it's a lender to a person's confidence it's um, it's it's um, a nurturer of their imagination and their creativity, and it definitely has so much possibility. It can be a catalyst to what they do for their future. It, they don't have to take a profession, um, you know, become a professional in it. They just simply need to have the skill, the ability. And so that's what I'm challenging uh, the people at Odyssey to do. And we, you know, we're always looking for uh, musicians, uh, donation of equipment. Uh, we are, we well, we, I'm gonna say, all right, we have started a coding program. I have a couple of coders who are willing to teach children how to code, life-changing life-changing and so children and adults we'll teach adults to code too but definitely children all of these things are things that we're working on we have when it comes to the women we have programs for the women uh, to help them deal with um, childhood sexual abuse domestic abuse um, and other so many other things the prevalence of Childhood sexual sexual abuse, domestic abuse, intimate partner violence, and intimate partner homicide. It's so rampant right now in the black community. I don't think we understand the depth of it. And we're talking about on the conservative side, 40% on the conservative side, there are multiple studies and reports. And the conservative is 40 plus percent of all black women at some point during their childhood, meaning when they were minor under the age of 18 experience some form of childhood sexual abuse. On the liberal side of these reports, as many as 60%. I ran into this phenomenon probably 20 years, 20, 20 plus years ago uh, when I was counseling. And it seems like every black female that came to me, when we unraveled and unpacked and peeled back the layers, that was childhood sexual abuse. To the point that I called a couple of other black uh, counselors, therapists, whatever, and asked, you know, I wanted to know, okay, is this something that's pl playing out in society the way it's playing out in my office, or am I just the magnet for women who have gone through that? You know, that can happen. You can have such a spiritual gift in doing something that the people who need you will find you. And, but I needed to know scientifically what was going on. And I was getting the same thing from these other people. Man, it's, it's, it's crazy how it is. But there were, at that time, no real studies on it that isolated the incidents when it came to black women. But now we know that the second leading cause of death for black women between the ages of 14 and for black females, I hate calling a 15-year-old uh, a woman, between females 15 and 44 is intimate partner homicide. The people who were supposed to protect them killed them. Uh, there are all type of circumstances to me and I'm just a man that believes there's no circumstance outside of your life in imminent danger do you bring harm to a woman? Now, if you got a gun pointed at you, all bets are off. You got a knife coming at you, all bets are off. But anything outside of that, there's no excuse for harming a woman. Now, if you got one of them, you one of those rare cases where you got a woman that throw hands and she's better at it than you and you've been getting your ass whooped. And I'm saying that, and it's probably not the best way to say that, because there are men who are abused by their women. Some of them are abused because they're literally 
not as physically dominant as the woman. Others get abused because their woman know they won't fight back. Whether you are male or female, take yourself out of domestic situations. But here's the dangerous part for a woman. While uh, statistics show that black males and black females uh, commit domestic violence almost at the same rate, 23 and 24%, the problem comes on the more violent side when it comes to actual killing their partner. Black men are far more lethal than women. When it comes to killing someone over a breakup, black men are far more lethal than women, black women. And none of that stuff is good. None of that stuff is right, but we've got to get an answer on it. And that's what I've given so much. If you haven't, if you don't understand why I'm so passionate about it, because I don't do a whole lot of talking about the science as much as I used to. Uh, and I'm going to get back to that. I'm going to talk about what are some of the things, but you need to read my book, Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. It's my 19th book. Uh, the link is going to be in the description box every time I post a video. You need to read that book. You need to understand why I'm so passionate about it and why I have such a command on what's going on. I've spent 30 years of my life understanding this. I've stood on the backs of some unbelievable genius and brilliant people to gain an understanding. And then I went deeper. I went longer. I went, I went in. I mean, I'm in psychology because of Dr. Francis Chris Wilson. Um, Dr. Naeem Agbar uh, shook my world and changed my whole idea about psychology from an Afrocentric perspective. Dr. Amos Wilson is probably the greatest influencer of how I move and how I think, especially when it comes to black children. So, I mean, and, th and, and that's just some. Man, I go back, I, I studied Carter G. Woodson inside and out before I knew about Frances Chris Wilson, but it was her that made me, I had narrowed down what I was going to do when I first came across Frances Chris Wilson. 1985, I was in high school, my junior year, and she was on the Phil Donahue show, and she was defending the Crest theory of color confrontation. This is, what, seven years before the ISIS papers are even released, but she's defending her dissertation, the Crest theory of color confrontation, um, why white people do what they do, and she was doing it on the heels of the argument about black intellectual inferiority uh, in the early 80s and the suggestion that black children are simply not as smart as whites using uh, flawed science like IQ tests to make that argument. And we were just coming out of that and comes this brilliant black woman giving them white men the business. And, you know, I was, I've been pro-black Malcolm X since a kid. So this was on for me. And it just started from there and it's been my life work yes i make a living doing what i do i make make a living doing a number of things and yes i make a living with but i give so much to understanding my people and my people are a priority to me they have been a priority to me for years i'm saying all that because we have got to do a better job of supporting programs that are actually doing things because this is what i'm gonna tell you and you can believe me you, you don't have to here's what i can tell you that Anytime you see millions of dollars pumped into a program, the program doesn't work. There are missing links. There are missing elements and components that ensure that it won't work. It looks good on the surface. It's good for aesthetics. It's a great political ploy, but it doesn't work. You know it doesn't work because you can see things getting worse in your community. You can see things getting worse in every area that matters. Education, uh, incarceration, uh, homicide, violence, uh, all the areas, socioeconomic uh, fluidity, the widening of the wealth gap. We aren't winning in any place. Things are getting worse. The illusion that things are better is out there constantly, but they're not. They keep telling us about the 1.4 trillion. They don't tell you that that 1.4 trillion isn't wealth. 1.4 trillion in wealth is 1.4 trillion in buying power. That's a different things. Most of our buying power isn't in owned wealth. It's in credit and that means that we're building debt which is working against our wealth that's one of the reasons our the wealth gap is widening they don't tell you that that's the little play that they use on things that make you feel like hey we we doing better no 1.4 is buying power that's the amount of, of that's our ability of what we can spend and that's predominantly in debt and I'm going to touch on that 
in, in the coming days and weeks, but I wanted to make sure that I came to you today through today through Monday evening we're going to do this the goal is $5,000 uh, I'm going to try the best to keep you abreast of it I'm not real good at this I get fussed at all the time by the people at Odyssey because I don't push because I don't go hard I'm just real big on the idea that if a person sees what you're doing, they believe in you, they get behind you. And I understand that that's not really how we move. It has to be shiny, it has to be entertaining. Um, you know, we'll, we'll contribute to a lot of things, but the things that are really grassroots, there's so many people that I know, associates and people I know, friends, who do things that change lives in the black community, can't get support. It's, it's a struggle all the time. So I'm challenging you. I am challenging you to step forward and be a part and contribute. On this note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. And you guys have an unbelievable remainder of your weekend.